Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Property Hustler Show. Today, Skyler and I are joined by a very special guest who is a Canadian real estate investor, having focused on the multifamily real estate market and grown to over a hundred doors. He is the founder of Infinite Results Coaching, which helps real estate investors grow and scale to their end goal the fastest. So here we have the man, the myth, the legend, Corey McKinnon. So Corey, great to have you on the show. Hey, thanks for having me here, guys. I'm super excited to jump in and teach the audience a few things. Yeah, so I've been buying real estate since 2005. So I think okay. this is year 18 or 19. Okay. And I started off with a six plaques. Yeah. So started off with a six plaques. Yeah. Eh? So that was and no that was rinky back, dinky single or duplex. Uh, well, there was no, and, and the hardest thing was like there was no information back then. There was no YouTube. There was no, I think there was like some Rich Dad Poor Dad seminars going on. There was obviously a few books. Yeah. 2005, that's when the Rich Dad Poor Dad was like hot on the market too. Yeah. I took some training with them maybe in t when my son was born. So it was about 12 years ago. Mm. Did a little bit. Yeah. You know, I took some courses and stuff through them but it was my, mainly about the people in the room like they the information there was okay but the people that i met there i still do business with them today mm -hmm. right just they they attracted a, or at least it used to attract a good good group of people in the room well i mean it almost sounds like when you, this is a back in the day thing where i think the networking wasn't as easy back then where you really had to try to find like-minded people i think to get everybody in a room together of that sort of yeah, unless you were going to a paid conference, like there wasn't really, there wasn't meetups, there wasn't like annual summits and all those things, right? It was like, you know, pay to go learn from this organization and that's how you could get in around some other investors and business owners, right? People seem to have a lot of the same struggles, especially if you're a real estate investor in Canada. And uh, I feel like some of these guys go to these groups and it's almost like therapy. It's like you go to these places, you talk to people <laughs> who are like minded. Yeah. yeah. And it's just like, you get it. Yeah. You get it. Thank you. Right. Yeah. And you can share this. Because otherwise, when you, if you talk to your regular group of friends, and I see people have this all the time, I mean, it's different in your situation. Like in a lot of us who are deep in the industry, yep. we're talking to people all the time about this stuff. But sure. I, but your everyday people. life, I mean, you spend half your time in business and like half your time outside of the business. And yeah. it can be lonely, right? You're kind of on like investor island out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. Unless you go to the island. And hang out with people like you guys who understand it. It's uh, it's different. Plus, yeah. I'm married to a government employee, so if I go to like her, uh, you know, teacher parties or whatever, it's like they look at me like I have three heads and one arm. <laughs> See, that's <laughs> so, what I get. That's what I get. Right. I yeah. I don't have many friends, family, in real estate. So it's like anytime they ask me about like how's work, right? How's investing? It's like I don't really want to talk about it because you know there's nothing relatable here. Yeah. yeah. Right. And I tell people, hey, this guy. If I were to say to my friend, hey, this buddy owes me ten grand. What do you, what are you doing? He owes you yes, ten grand. I know. It's like what a tenant that owes you ten grand. That's you know. In your room of real estate investors. Yeah, you're like I got someone normal. owes me twenty grand. I got someone yeah, owes me thirty. Yeah, that's normal. Grand, right? Last yeah. year was twenty. You know, the year before that was twenty five. Yeah, right? actually, and speaking of that, because didn't you have one guy whose parents paid the twenty thousand dollars? This is when the tribunal was like you would go to downtown and, and go in person. Okay, yeah. And then the parents would show up with a check, right? And it would have to be like a certified check, like the funds yeah. are good. And it's like, hey, the uh, it's it's halted. We're gonna stop it. Yeah. Crazy, yeah. Right. And then you know what happens after that though is that that guy doesn't pay for four months, yeah. and then parents. And then we call the parents. They doesn't pay for four months, and then it's like you know, N eight time. Crazy. Right. Those yeah. those times where you gotta call parents. Like that guy's never getting back on track. When yeah, he's fifty two years old, like he's never he's never gonna pay his bills on time. Yeah, and I find like depending on who you're talking to, there's different levels of the conversation of how deep you want to go with people. So yeah, for people that don't get it, it's just surface level. Hey, yeah, it's going okay. You know, how's the weather? Yeah. How's your favorite sport team? Like, what are you up to? That kind of stuff. But, you know, as you get to around people that are either interested in the stuff or do this stuff all the time, then you can go deeper and share more. And then there's obviously people that you, only very few people may on your inner circle mm -hmm. that you totally confide in everything that's really going on. How do you life. find doing 18 years of being a landlord and now you're still collecting rent? Because I've only been doing it for five years and my patients are thin. My patients are very, very thin when it comes to collecting rent. Yeah. Like how do you how do you find driving to Brantford, taking that time out of your day to go collect that ten grand? Like how's that That's, mental that mental energy coming home talking about, you know, how was your day? I lined it up. So I talked to them last week and I said, Well, I am literally passing by, so I lined it up when it was actually passing by. Otherwise they're ready to mail me a check. I'm like, mm, we can do that, but I want to make yeah. sure I actually get it. I can count on one hand the number of times I've had to kind of do that sort of mm. stuff. So it's obviously important for people to hear that the more work you do up front on your screening and your due diligence, and these are all things that can totally be outsourced to help and staff and things of that nature, yeah. right? A lot of our personalities as real estate investors, we're like, go, 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 fire, fire, ready, aim. And we got to make sure we have that admin team behind us that can actually help us check the boxes. So if, but you know, Hey, uh, what is the saying? Uh, bad things happen to good people too. So great people lose their jobs and 
you just want people doing the right thing. Like people who are going to hear about these rent strikes and everything. And they're like, that is crazy. I'm never going to do that. Right. You, you just want to yeah. make sure that you're doing the best you can to find that. And luckily in my past career i had a, a 17 years of hr experience so okay. for me it's like pretty good at getting a read on people and pretty quickly and you know i've actually got uh, this this list that i give to my students it's like 15 red flags to avoid with your tenants right mm. um even little things like someone just walks into the unit they don't shake your hand they're just like walking into the unit they're checking it out and they'll make uh hi let's talk a little bit right yeah totally brush you off there's no rapport that's probably well i've never rented to somebody like that so that's a big red flag we yeah. do the car thing like look at Look inside the person's yeah. car, like see how yeah. dirty the car is. Yeah, or look how they take care of themselves, yeah. you know. Um, you know, a lot of people, things obviously change. People have piercings and tattoos and things all over the place. But yeah, the car is a good indication of how you do one thing is how you do everything. Mm -hmm. You know, are they using their car as a garbage can or are they, yeah. you know, it's okay to have an older car, but like to keep it clean and tidy and yeah. Yeah. maintain, right? The things you're speaking of, these are genuine experiences. These are the things that another person who's in real estate is going to come and talk to you and be like, you know, you get it, you understand. And when you realize that, it's like when you start to get into deeper things that you grow into as a real estate investor, it's like you go through the stages and motions and maybe you do a few things because it keeps you in touch. It keeps you in tune. Yeah. Like the fact that you will, that to, to check on your property, I know some people who are totally absent and if they ever discuss, uh, you know, some of the challenges that you can tell that they're a little twice removed. Yeah. Right. But uh, being in tune with things uh, allows you to keep a hand uh, like a finger on the pulse of what matters. Sure. Right. So it's, it, I think it's really good to do so. You're focusing right now a lot on education. I am. Yeah. Because I, I want to make sure people get the right messages. And um, to what you were saying earlier, right, you're getting, you know, your patients are thin with these things. Right. So it's you got to make sure you're surrounding yourself with the right people because, you know, real estate is supposed to be boring. <laughs> If I actually added up how many checks I've collected over the years, it's uh, I think last time I counted it was like 10,000 checks or something like that. So yes, it gets really mundane. And <laughs> like even a couple of years into it, I'm like, I'm just tired of posting the ads for like the units and all that stuff. But you make a template, you make yeah. a standard operating procedure of like how someone else can do it. And at my past company, so I used to teach people how to run student work painting franchises. Okay. And sometimes they'd actually be in like just getting a high school. So we're yeah. dealing with like a 17 or 18 year old, but we teach them how to run a six figure business in six months of the year so i was used to like making just operating systems and making it kind of idiot proof to the point where i've actually had you know first year college students showing my units and letting contractors in for quotes and you know so when your systems are really strong you can actually have someone pretty young as long as they're responsible and mature for their age you know doing some of the things i wouldn't make i wouldn't let them make decisions but you can make some expensive mistakes with real estate right oh. so if you invest a little bit into getting in the right rooms or around the right people or getting some advice right there's lots of great free advice out there Mm -hmm. But who are you going to call when you got a really sticky situation, right? I guess you could call your lawyer or yeah, maybe someone else. Yeah, burn money. Yeah. Who, yeah, someone else who's been in the situation. But that, everybody's busy too, right? So yeah. we want to make sure that whoever works with us, they're getting a great return on their investment and 5, 10x, you know, whatever they've invested in themselves for sure. I learned one lesson from one of my mentors a long time ago and it still just keeps paying dividends all the time, right? If you put a, I'll throw it out to you guys, if you... Put a little spot on your application form saying um, something around the lines of, you know, what is your budget for the unit and, you know, what's your maximum offer you'd like to mm -hmm. put down for rent, right? So especially in a situation where you have like five or 10 people that want the unit, we always finish our phone call with, hey, we, we liked you. You're one of the top people. Is there anything that you would do to set yourself apart from the other applicants? And we're not saying you have to go bid up the rent or anything like that, but would you be open to paying not just first and last month's rent, but maybe a third month rent just to show some strength there or mm -hmm. get a print like get a guarantor or different things of that nature right yeah. so it's a very job interview line question yeah right every, it is and every reverse, job interview they would ask that on why, yeah. why you're going to be a great tenant right yeah, you yeah. Know, well, you, it's good we, do you have good furniture like are you going to stage the place do you have a pet like just we talk a lot about uh the fundamentals and the basics and then people start to so fall important. into this gray area of questioning which is like is this legal or illegal and sometimes i feel like they they already assume that something is illegal when when the, the wording is very specific right in the guidelines at least for example like you're not allowed to demand bank statements right from uh from applications from applicants or you you can't demand a social insurance number right and there's a difference between, um, or you can't accept checks, right? It's not that you can't accept checks. You cannot require that they get pay you in post-dated checks. They can, right? But people get stuck on these things. And so, uh, for example, we have in our application form. I love, I love the wording where people think it's illegal. It's like, well, yeah. no, it's against the, you know, landlord tenant act. So it's an act. Like, you know, if I if I say only you can only pay me in checks, I'm not going to jail. So I'm not breaking. The yeah yeah law but i am breaking some parts of the, exactly of the and i think i think there is a lot of lack 
of education when it comes to what these things actually mean. For example, and, and that came into question when we were telling people that, yeah, ask for bank statements, it's okay. And they said, well, isn't that illegal to do? And it's like, no, it's not. The, the reason why, and there's, there can be legitimate reasons why you can offer an option for somebody to give that. For example, if somebody's applying to you and they want to rent out your place, let's say they are a new immigrant to the country, they don't have a job, they don't have credit, they don't have any of these yep. things, but they came here more with more, a big bank account. Days. More, yeah, exactly. But they came here with a reserve and they have money and they want to demonstrate to you that they can pay. Why shouldn't they be allowed to give you some bank statements to indicate this? I think it's reasonable, right? For sure. And uh, you're leaving that as an option for them. Otherwise, if you just didn't ask, they would have no way to show that they are, they'll pay rent. And a, a good thing for people to understand is that, you know, you should really have your own checklist of all these things that you're looking for, for cr criteria to determine like apples to apples or apples to oranges, who actually scores the best. And if, if you ever have to turn somebody down, you can just say, well, these were the reasons why, right? Other people just scored higher than you. So they're mm -hmm. higher qualified. And it's not like I have to go, I, I rent the unit out to the highest qualified person. So, and you can have different criteria on there and they're all, I don't know, give them a score out of five or something like that. And we're looking for the best score out of a hundred. Exactly. Right? So yeah. it's important for them to have that mental checklist there. And one of them could be like, show us some financial strength and how are you going to prove that if we don't have some of these things? And this is where people start to get, as you go deeper and deeper into your real estate endeavors, a little more sophisticated, a little bit more methodical, a little more, more measured. And then you bring some rhyme and reason to what you're doing, yes. right? Which... So, many, so many people out there. I mean, real estate investing should be treated like a business. Yeah. But a lot of people, they get the first property too, and they're just gunslinging and they don't have any, like any systems or they go and watch something on YouTube or listen to a podcast and they get the tactics. Okay, this is the tactic, this is the strategy, but it goes, you know, the fundamentals and the principles of, you know, the undisputable truths of, yep. you know, business and, you know, making money and all those different things. Um, then you get into like, okay, this is the strategy behind implementing that. And then, okay, these are the tactics, like the boots on the ground, things that you have to implement yeah. to be able to be successful, right? But a lot of people just skip to the tactic and they don't get all the other they got to get the mindset behind it and the reasoning behind it and everything else too. And that's why we have a lot of tenants not paying rent because they've been getting away with it for so long because we have a bunch of these landlords that don't know <laughs> oh, what they're doing. Terrible. You know, these Facebook groups and everything and oh. rent, rent strikes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you get, I was just talking to somebody um, who's going to be speaking at our next event and he's like, literally took over this 18 unit building and, you know, they wanted to turn it over and stuff like that. But there was like somebody who lived there and she's like the the house mom and she was literally just telling everybody, no, don't, don't do this. Mm -hmm. Don't, don't take any, you know, anything that they're going to offer you and things like that. When people see the landlord, especially on an 18 unit building, they think that you're living on, on the bridal path in Toronto, driving no. a Lamborghini and half your time spent in Cancun. No. Right. Most of the time it's landlords like us that, you know, we still work a day job and, you know, we save all our money so we can buy another property. Big time. Right. So a lot of the media, you know, spills it out and, you know, we're, we're the ones that got to, that, how do you say that? Like, it's getting harder and harder. It's getting harder and harder for the small landlord and the big landlord has all these reserves and funds. And they kind of like it because eventually they're going to win. Yeah. And they do, you know, when you show up at the LTB and you're making a scene, right, the adjudicator will sway one way. He does have to make a decision. I think it will end up getting a little bit more like Europe. Have you guys ever been over to Europe or just seen how they do things over um, there? So, I grew up in Greece, so. Okay. Yeah. Like I've, I've spent time over in Italy and I've had friends that have spent time in Switzerland. And I mean, real estate is just more and more valuable over there. And even just to, so chances of you becoming a property owner are very slim. So you just become a renter for life. And a lot of these uh, rental leases will kind of get handed down from like generation mm. to generation. So the mom moves out and maybe she moves in with like a, one of her, you know, kids because she needs someone to look after her. And then like her daughter will take over the unit because they just want to keep that rental because it's very hard to get a rental yeah. over there, especially in certain areas. Right. So with inflation, the way it's going, like I, uh, and we're so many houses behind here in Canada, like there's such a, a backlog of demand and need for housing. Right. So, but. You know, we're definitely a ways off from that. And this is where people need to, I think, stay ahead, educate themselves, learn, and make sure that uh, they are learning from credible sources, right? You you started doing this, uh, you, you, your your education program, you partnered with uh, Danielle, right? Yeah, recently. I mean, I've been educating people on real estate investing since I retired from corporate. So it was 10 years ago because yeah. I had all these people. I was able to do this through, you know, hustling and grinding. I love the name <laughs> of the podcast here, by the way. Thank you. And um when somebody sees you retire from corporate after doing it for like six, seven years, they're like, well, how did you do it? Like, you know, so I, I started mentoring people unofficially. It was kind of like accountability and giving them tips and, mm -hmm. you know, training them because everybody's totally different. And then, um, a few years into it, I'm like, you know what, this, this is really showing proof of concept. I'm just going to go all in on this and mm -hmm. do group training, do one-on-one -on -one training, do events, do meetups, all those different things. And then 
Um, you know, me and Danielle, we actually met at a right club meetup like five, six years ago. We were on a panel together and we just stayed in touch since then. And, you know, she's done some training. I've done training. She has resources. I got resources. We both have different personality types. I think she was on this podcast yeah. as well. So, um, you know, we kind of, you know, it's definitely one plus one equals five. There's no like one plus one equals two there because she has a different energy, speaks to a different part of the crowd and she helps people with their vision and their purpose. And I help more on the accountability and the implementation and the, the tactics and the, you know, running, running things like a business. Right. So, yeah. No, that, that's amazing. And th this is where I think partnerships are very important. You know, actually it surprises mm -hmm. me how many people, uh, actually I shouldn't say it surprises me, but uh, partnerships are hard to form, hard to come by. And uh, when one is able to be fostered and grow together, your reach isn't twice as far. It is phenomenally different. And, for, and you, you, have, you have somebody who is literally there with you and they're, they have a different level of accountability than you can ever pay for. Yes. Right. So I mean, uh, that having a partnership like that, I feel that there's a long way that that, that you're able to go with that. So, but with that, I want to know, like, what is the vision for this? Like, what are the what is it that you want to be focusing when it comes to the teaching? Yeah. So our focus is making sure that people get strong fundamentals, right? Because we want people to succeed. Like, we want people to succeed. We, we don't want people just to sign up for like expensive conversations on the phone or expensive you know events that you go to once in a while so we want people to understand the fundamentals and then actually have the confidence to go take the appropriate action and everybody you know the challenge is everybody comes in with different goals uh, different background different personality um, so it's like they're a unique recipe and we need to work with that recipe and make it a more of a masterpiece right or mm -hmm. like a delicious you know five star meal or whatever it might be um, so we go to the pantry, we've got lots of things that we can pull from the pantry and, you know, accountability is something that holds everything together, right? So we can give them the best training, the best tools, resources, all that. But if they don't do anything with it at the end of the day, they have to. So we make, we want to break it down, make it simple so that people can understand, okay, buying a multiplex, it's probably a hundred steps or more to do that. But let's make sure that you're seeing wins and you're, you're, you know, running through five to 10 steps a week so that you can get there at some point, or if you got to raise money or if you got to build your power team or whatever it might be, underwriting deals. So many people don't understand the numbers. You know, this is, for me, I was, I used to treat math like a sport in, in school, right? So it's, I get the numbers, I understand the numbers, but not a lot of, not everybody's like that, right? So you gotta make sure they understand that too. Yeah, I, I always found that that is a hurdle. Um, I, I always believe that in order to teach people, you have to either teach people that you can relate to, or you have to be someone who can understand uh, someone else's needs, someone else's gaps, right? And uh, I wanna know if there's anything that makes you feel that you are, I'm going to use the word qualified, but sure. it's not just qualified in an experienced way. Obviously, you have the experience to to and the knowledge. Yes, but teaching is very specific, right? So, what do you think is uh, gives you an edge and a knack for being able to properly help someone? Hey, great question. I, um, you're right, because just because somebody is good at buying real estate doesn't mean they're good at teaching or helping other people. And um, I literally got my. I told this story before, but I literally got my first. Uh, request to tutor somebody in like grade three or four so and i was like oh hopefully it's a subject i really like and it was like no it was like french so i had to go learn <laughs> french at a higher level to be able to teach my friend who needed to pass right and we um we got him passed and all that sort of stuff and the, and the mom was the parent was like like she's like literally you're on the short list and you're the only person on the list you know we want you to help him mm. so i was like whoa like I, I've got to find a way to do that's this. That's a serious conversation for somebody it, that great. Yeah, it is, right? And uh, they're willing to pay for it and stuff, and that was cool. Um, and then I continued doing that a little bit throughout grade school. But then in, you know, in high school, I was on the peer, t peer tutor club. Not a cool club to be a part of, but I, you know, at that point, I was like, somebody framed it to me really well about six years ago. They're like, Corey, everybody's called to be a leader, just not everybody takes that call. So you got that call at a young age, and you just kept going with it, and you kind of take it as a responsibility to, I know what it's like to struggle, to be in pain and like, you know, not be able to learn something and maybe be made fun of or teased or whatever, but in business and in things like assets and things they don't teach you in school, um, you know, I think everybody deserves to get ahead. They just, they need to be around other people doing it. They need to be in that environment. They need to show, see that it's possible. Mm -hmm. So I guess I've been doing this sort of stuff since I was, I don't know, so let's call it in high school or even I continue that in college. And then right out of college, I took a um, my corporate career was like literally teaching people how to run a franchise in a business, right? So I've got, you know, 30 years of experience doing this. Plus a national level athlete, always coaching other people in the club. Okay, there's somebody new in the club. You've been there for five years. You're working with the new guy because the coach who's been in the Olympics a couple of times, he's busy working with the best people. So mm -hmm. the coach gives responsibility to other people here. So you just learn what works and you can't just, I think that one of the biggest things is actually relating to different personality styles. Like you guys are totally different. 
So we can't just coach you the same way, right? It's got to be um, customized coaching based yeah. on personality. There's lots of different personalities out there and whether they're kinesthetic or visual or fact finder or action taker or they're great at starting things but not following through with things. They love admin stuff, but they or they hate sales or they love sales and they hate admin. So you got to really adapt to the person you're working with. I think that's where a lot of people fail. They think they can just do it one way or it's like, I'm a great flipper, I'll teach you how to flip and then they flop. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> perfect. By the way, that that's a great way to answer that. I mean, I think uh, that can easily illustrate what puts you in a position where you will have the capacity mm -hmm. to teach. Where I think a lot of other people lack that. A lot of people just strictly lean on. When I say a lot of other people, I should say like there's people who come on and they all they talk about is their accomplishments, what they've done, and mm -hmm. their successes, right? And that is the that's sales pitch, you right? The, yeah, it gets you the starting line. Yeah, it gets but you the starting line, right? What else are you gonna do? But yeah, no, uh, being there, it's it's a burden. Uh, and if you care, if you're the type of person that cares, right? There's an emotional tax about wanting to see people succeed and being responsible for somebody else who is effectively like they're hiring you to help them mm -hmm. take their transform their lives because that's what it is. This is a transformation in real estate, especially for those of us who have leveraged real estate, used the vessel of real estate to transform our lives. And we want to be able to see that for other people too, right? There's only so many of you. Being there's one, <laughs> yeah. and uh, it and t being able to tailor teaching to individuals has its own challenge, right? So I want to know um, in in your teaching practice, do you believe that there is a plateau or a a a cap or ceiling to what it is that you're able to teach, um, or versus what you're going to be able to package, or like how are you addressing this? Sure, sure. No, that's a, that's another great question. So. Uh, great podcast, guys. We usually, we usually get on there like, tell us about your childhood. Tell us about what you bought. We'll what do, what do you do later. next? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I take coaching and mentor my sh my, uh, mentorship myself. And I've been kind of brought behind the curtain of some fairly big organizations. So I've had a Tony Robbins coach for nine years now. And I think she's one of over a thousand coaches in that organization. So I'm, you know, over the years, I've picked her brain a little bit. You know, we work on what we're working on. But then I'm also like, so how do you guys do this? Or how do you guys do that? And so they have a train the trainer program because they're like Tony, Tony Robbins can't teach everybody here. Like he's literally impacted millions of people. And now he's got like a mass. He basically won't work with you unless you're willing to pay him multiple, multiple millions every single year. And he's got a five year waiting list. And, yeah, and really he, well, he wants, <laughs> yeah. a, he wants to cut your business basically. Yeah. Right. Which is fair. Cause he's going to blow up your business and it's a, it's a good win win, but he wants to take on the biggest businesses. So he gets, everybody wins the most mm -hmm. and totally understandable. A lot of other people are doing that model too, like Grant Cardone and uh, Alex Hormozzi and all that sort of stuff. So, um, but it makes sense. So, you know, I only look for coaches who have good experience, good track record, good values, good integrity, um, good work ethic. And they also have that, their willingness to carry that burden to serve as well. And then I teach them all my systems and principles of like, how do we make sure that we're making, um, getting people the right, you know, recipe in the formula based on their goals, experience, personality types, learning styles, all those different things. And I help work with them on the, the blueprint the blueprints for everybody too because they're similar but they're going to be different and sometimes you know you're making a, a recipe and you got to add a little bit more of this a little bit of that you know so i'm involved in everybody's um, learnings and teachings and then i'm obviously spending time on leadership in the company and making more extra content and um, i'm still available more of a on a group basis if they're not one of my one-on-one -on -one clients but um, i want to make sure that people have access to me whether it's on the uh, calls a few times a month or the events that we hold once a quarter or the in-person events that we hold every month now too. And that's a great method to go about that because again, there there is, I think, a limit to how many people you're able to tailor to. <clears throat> and um, you're, it, it sounds like you're doing the canopy method where you're bringing people up right with you and then afterwards you are going to be relying on those people being able to bring up the next level of people with them, right? And if you're able to instill the values that got you to where you are, there's no reason why the people who you've mentored won't be able to do the same. Sure. Right, if you yeah. get the same values, so yeah, I think that that's you like, look at some of the biggest companies in the world. Like, I don't go and eat at McDonald's, but you know, McDonald's has a great training program, from what I understand, uh, Burger U or whatever they call it, and they've literally made their systems to the point where there's 21 or 22 steps on how to make French fries, and like someone in grade five can do it. Mm -hmm. First step might be go to the freezer, get the box, cut it open away from you, so you don't cut yourself. Like all these different steps, but. And then like, how do they supervise those people? How do you, you know, who's the regional manager? Who's, who's the general manager? All these different things. And I saw this a lot in my other company where people started off as a painter, then a crew chief, and then an area manager, and then a district manager, general manager. I was VP of operations for Eastern Canada. And then there's the owner, hmm. right? So 
you know, there's got to be leadership. There's got to be good, strong leadership, and you got to have good systems for growth and development everywhere. It sounds very organized and structured. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's very compl complicated to implement, right? And and find these things. It takes time. Things end up becoming measurable in uh, very complex methods, I think. You know, it's kind of like when people start getting very sophisticated in hiring employees and they start having the charts that describe personalities and mm -hmm. then they start drawing pictures or squiggles and then it's just like, you're this squiggle and now we're hiring you, right? And yeah. it starts to get more sophisticated as things become. Yeah, some, sometimes people might overthink things, but I also like to take something really complicated and make it simpler so that more people mm -hmm. can assimilate it. Like one of my biggest pet peeves is when you go to talk to someone and they want to talk like high level industry, you know, knowledge and acronyms and all this other stuff. It's like, explain it to me like I'm a grade seven. You know, Rich Dad Poor Dad was written at like the grade five to grade seven reading level. Yeah. Book has impacted so many people, including myself and I'm sure you guys as well. Um, so when you can take something really complicated and break it down, yeah, some, some jobs when you're hiring for them, you're, you're looking for a very specific personality type. And that's, that's okay, right? So just make sure that you're looking for that personality type. And that's what the test does. The test does the work for you. We use predictive index. It's a great, it's like using disc, but it's in like three dimensions and it's, it's a lot deeper and broader. I was brought up with like the disc of four personalities. You know, you're a driver, you're an influencer, you're, um, you know, conscientious or you're a little bit, uh, you're the S, right? Yeah. But no, you know, perfect, yeah. the worst thing that people can do is, is complicate things, you know, because a, a confused mind does nothing. And therein comes the challenge of being able to transcend the simplicity because, for example, I know that I think about a lot of things and it's simple here. But what is simple for me sometimes isn't simple for others and vice versa, all right? And it depends on what area you're in, which is why people often look for others who have traveled the same journey that they seem to be on. Because again, people want resonance. People want to know that they get it. But it requires work. There's no doubt about that. You know, everything requires work, whether it's, uh, but you want to make it uh, repeatable. So if something ever happened to me, like the goal is to actually have this continue on yeah. as a legacy, uh, even if I'm not here, because like the, the coach's manual and the training manuals and all those things are still in place. Yeah. All, the, uh, all the materials are still in place. Someone I mean, else just has to lead the room. Forget if you're not here. I mean, if you want to take a break, Want to go on vacation, yes. right? People, yeah, you don't people, have a true business if you can't take a break. Yeah, there's a lot of short-term thinking that people can can like think about that uh, because so many people get into these things, and it's the same for a lot of real estate investors. You know, no, I mean, you. I was going to say you have no idea. That's not going to be true, but so many people uh, look at real estate as the vessel that is going to liberate them from the shackles of their. Because when you said you retired from your corporate work, a lot of people view that as you've been liberated from that corporate position, right? And everybody views it a little differently. They buy investment property. And then they realize that the way they did it is like they ran, they're running another job. Yes. Right? It's kind of like you, you invested into a gas station and you're manning the till now, right? And then people do that sometimes with their rental property. They buy a property and instead of going home to spend, spend time with their families, they're driving around to another city where they could afford to buy the rental property. And then they're dealing, they're, they're, they're plunging a toilet or trying yes. to, you know, fix something that they're not qualified to do, right? That's right. So, and, and people end up and that kind of breaks one crap. of the first fundamentals that we have, which is you got to make sure you get good enough money on the buy that you can outsource things, right? Because mm -hmm. if you can't afford to hire, you don't have a budget for maintenance and CapEx and all those other things, right? You shouldn't be having to use your day job to fund the roof that's going to be needed in five years. You know, if, if you knew it needed a roof right when you bought it, hey, that's something you should have budgeted for. Make sure you have the reserves for that right out of the gates. But one of the best things people can do is actually not invest. You know, in the beginning, it's probably good to be close to your properties because it's like, you just don't know what you don't know and people learn by being there and seeing and doing and all that sort of stuff but after the first couple you know it's actually not bad you know how to build a power team go do it an hour or two away so that you're not going to be tempted to drive an hour mm -hmm. to go deal with things right yeah so, where and i try to teach this to my property managers too like we got to set up systems in place so that like yesterday we had a tenant saying um hey the furnace isn't working mm -hmm. and she was tempted to go drive there i'm like no 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 try to troubleshoot it over the phone with them first <laughs> it was just a simple <laughs> it, like literally they just didn't turn the thermostat to the heat to the heat mode right and then turn it on and now it's working right yeah so. the past two days we've been getting a lot of phone calls about oh, we've had no the temp, heat. temp drop oh for yeah. sure right yeah, it was beautiful for people that are listening yeah. to this we had like weather in the 20s and now it's in the teens so we gotta get the, those yeah. furnaces and, and it happened on the weekend right so yeah, that the temperature weekend, drops yeah. so for sure people aren't um, yeah. good luck paying for that service call it's gonna be double oh yeah, yeah. crazy uh, what two double batteries can do and then on a saturday you know you send uh, technicians 150 bucks 200 bucks right a lot of times you go there it's just dead batteries yep right the tenant can take the thermostat off and put the batteries in the back and plug it back in it's crazy how easy something is even a furnace filter furnace filter may be a little bit clogged right now right it's very easy to take it out and put a new one in yeah, that's right? why you got to make. Send the like, landlord the bill. Send the landlord a twenty buck bill, and you bought a good one from Walmart, right? And that's how the landlord and tenant relationship should be, 
right? Hey, we changed, we knew it was going cold, so we changed the furnace filter. Never happens anymore. Never, ever happens. Yeah. I mean, one of the things we do is we just buy them in bulk. We uh, make sure that there's always like a half dozen at the property. And when it gets below three or four, we're buying some more. And that's just one of our property manager's jobs is you're in there at least once a quarter. Depends how dirty the, the systems are. Some, some of them need to be changed every couple months. Yeah. But, uh, you just got to do it. Some people complain about uh, problems that seem uh, silly, mundane, tedious. Even landlords who complain about how their tenant called them about a light bulb that burnt out. And a lot of the times we've had people tell us that they don't have that problem. We say, why? Well, because I left spare light bulbs at the property. Yeah. And they tenant said, is considerably less likely. The tenants, yeah. Letting them know, okay, light bulbs are consumable. Yeah. You know, they're like a sundry, like toilet paper. You're going to use them up. So we'll make sure they're all working when you move in. Yeah. yeah. Unless it's an outdoor light or a light in the common area, it's on It's on you. But yeah, like here's some extra. Yeah. Or, I mean, they, they don't cost much. It mostly, mostly, it's, mostly it's just the mental aggravation and the energy. Yeah. Right. And they're, they're, so, they're qualified to do this, but just yeah, don't, don't don't do too much other fix-up stuff. Tenants want to get their money's worth. They want to yeah. get their money's worth. Yeah. Because if the tenant owned that home, there's no way that they're paying a handyman to come and replace light bulb. There's yeah. no way. Uh, my favorite is the university True. students. The university students, I call... They, oh, they, they know how to they, do anything. No, they, <laughs> they does not change the light bulb one-on-one, and they haven't taken that program yet, uh, so they don't know how to do it. take the garbage out or clean the house. Not or anything, right? Right? So, so, yeah, that's those, why you got to get... like. You know, we find that the studious students that are good with group work, they, they typically do better in a student rental. Oh, really? Don't go for the partiers. Don't go for the, the pretty girls. Like go for the, maybe not necessarily engineers because their, their courses are so intensive that they just can't even like function, right? They're, they're doing school 50, 60 hours a week. But you, know, you, get, you get just really committed students who wouldn't know a party if it hit them upside the head <laughs> and with good parental cosigners and all those different things. Yeah. Right. And it comes down to good marketing. If you have good marketing for your unit, it can be an average unit, but you're casting such a big net, you're getting a lot of leads. Mm. And at some point, somebody's just going to be tired of, they're like, yep, this checks enough boxes. Or some people just don't want the grass is greener. They're like, yep, it works. We got four walls. We got this. We got that. You can figure things out in terms of like what works for you. And you can figure out the profile of people that you want in your property and how you're going to be dealing with them. Did you find anything with respect to, since we're just talking that, uh, gender-specific homes one is better than the other or i've had girls party just as hard as guys uh, i've had guys be really clean i've had guys be really dirty i've had females be really clean females be really dirty um you know in references people can get whatever they want from yeah. a reference right so i think you need to do you know just a little bit more back checking than that and uh, sometimes co-ed spaces can work well so if there's a couple girls couple guys living in a student house they kind of keep each other in check because they don't want to like don't want the girls to think I'm a slob. Don't want the guys to think I'm a slob or whatever. It can definitely go either way for sure. But I, I know some landlords and they swear by certain things, right? Like um, there's a lot of landlords who say that the, the female-only homes, they will be higher on the maintenance requests maybe a little bit because uh, they would They're say always like, cold and they take longer showers. Or whatever it is, right? <laughs> the hair in the drain, right? is a big yes. one, right? And these are things that like, it's just a uh, fact of the matter of fact, right? But they say that it's easier to re-let or to release the uh, the unit once when there's turnover. Um, however, they yeah females typically keep it looking nicer, so it's easier to when show. they know people are coming over. They make the like beds are made, everything is like nice, and uh, they 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 care about it. Uh, sometimes uh, the the male specific homes uh, less maintenance requests, but uh, when when you're showing it, they don't care. Right? They don't set anything up. They don't present the home. It's just yeah, sure, come in, and it is what it is. Right, so. Uh, people people find tendencies and it just depends on like what type of landlord are you well there's layers to it right yeah. so i mean at first for, okay male or female and then it's like okay well what do you do for a career or what program are you in okay great and True, then yeah. you know what are your accolades or like how do you carry yourself and how do they answer some of the questions so i we always ask like on a scale of one to ten how how loud are you guys right if they're like oh man we are yeah it's like yeah. you know i find that the younger they are the more open they are and they'll just kind of like spill their guts and mm. you know hopefully they're all listening to this too but um <laughs> it's all good uh, but it, it's great that they're honest and like I mean, if we have somebody that they're, they're like we're super quiet like we just like we just work or we just study or it's like you know when someone's busy right now i i didn't want to rent to some students at one of my um, nicer condos in the north end of sarnia but i'm like well we're getting a lot of applicants so how about we give it a go and i used to do a lot of this so i'm like show me the top three candidates and some of them were basketball players and i did some research because i actually know the basketball coach or uh, actually someone who's like the head physio for Lambton college lions mm. i said like what do you think of these players he's like oh he's older he's like 24 25 this is his last year playing basketball mm. he's got two jobs he's actually the the president of the sac office mm. student administration counselor or whatever so he's like <laughs> he might party a little bit but he's like so busy he's got he's got more to lose right his, yeah. his, his name his reputation all that sort of stuff right so mm -hmm. 
it's important and it's working out well so i knew it would and those are great reference check by the way it seems like you're a little more check you are in tune. facebook check them out on instagram oh well, i mean you know to make us like i'm very hands-on but i realize i can't scale that so yeah. i'll be as hands-on as i can for the first couple of years and learn everything i need to know and then hand that playbook over to somebody else who can totally do it it's like you can post the ad you can ask these questions you can you know go look them up on social media to see what they're like and all these different things right so. yeah because, uh, yeah, by the way, the, the intuition that you have is going to be something that you definitely have to outline if you want to. Because other people go and they hire and they don't know why they're disappointed with the way somebody else does it. But it's like the way you think is not going to be the way others do it, right? So being yep. able to bridge that gap is definitely going to be very Make advantageous. a good point. Yeah, like all problems are thinking problems, right? I used to think it was communication problems, but all problems are actually before communication, they're actually thinking. So if you can teach someone else how to think like you, Pull as much of your systems and everything, your way of filtering things out of your brain and try to give it to them, give the, give the playbook to them. Teach them how to think. And sometimes they're going to need a tune-up. You're going to have to... And people make mistakes, right? Just hopefully they make smaller mistakes that are easy to recover from, right? So I always tell people, fail, fail often, fail fast, fail forward, but don't, don't epic fail. Don't mm -hmm. fail when the stakes yeah. are high. Don't make $10,000, $50,000, $100,000 dollars mistakes. That is, that's very hard to recover from. Yeah. I've made small, you know, 100 bucks all the time. 500 bucks, 1,000 bucks, but you, you got to try to limit that. Yeah, there's there's the scrapes and bruises, and then there's the broken bones. Right? Yes, I like so, that. <laughs> you got you to gotta moderate what you're going to be concerned about. I want to ask you a couple questions that students uh, will have, um, and they're broad questions. You can tell me what maybe are some related questions that you get. Um, sure. So some of them revolve around financing, you know, and they want to people, especially a lot of new immigrants, younger ones too, and they say, is getting financing easy? What are some of the challenges around it? Um, what type of questions do you have and how do you answer those questions? General questions, right? Sure. So if somebody is new to the country, and but they want to get into an income property, um, first thing is that they've got to surround themselves with the right people. So if you're uh, one of the biggest mistakes that people make is they're like, I have a friend who's a, you know, my best friend's a mortgage broker. I'm like, okay, well, how long have they been a mortgage broker for? Like, you want to make sure that you're actually working with people who do volume and they're used to supporting real estate investors, right? That's kind of like the first thing. Mm -hmm. And that's a matter of like, how hard are you willing to work at this and collaborate and, you know, find all the, you know, loopholes and exceptions for you to get, you know, the better loan to value or find that better loan or, raise some money if you need to, right? But I, I wanna make sure people aren't being too aggressive. Um, their biggest superhero power is always gonna be to flex their abilities to go find a better deal. Because when you get into a great deal, you know, buying, making money on the buy solves a lot of problems, right? So if the market goes down, solves that problem. If the renovations go over budget, take too long, solves that, solves that, solves that. So fortunately, I've always realized that, maybe it's because I come from a frugal family, you know, four kids, my mom definitely found a way to stretch a dollar, that's for sure. I mean, she was clipping coupons and she had her own side hustle. She was cutting hair, delivering flyers, uh, babysitting, like whatever it took to make some money, you know, so we weren't a single family income. It was kind of like a one and a half income. Hmm. So I've learned that, that, you know, if I'm going to buy some of the biggest assets out there, I want to make sure that we're getting a good, good buy. You know, I'm not going to like haggle and fight for, but you know, if you can be creative as well, that goes a long way these days. Um, I see, you know, right now some of these uh, bigger apartment buildings, like the people are tired. They want to sell them off and they're willing to give creative terms. They're willing to give a VP, VTB, you know, whereas two or three years ago, that was pretty un uncommon because it was like, man, everything was done. real estate was going up like crazy. It was like an auction. So if you could even have something you could sell, like wholesalers are making a killing because like they're out there mm -hmm. marketing like crazy, finding people that thought the world was going to end and they had to sell their house, right? So, yeah, so I think uh, I... You know what? If you if, it kind of eliminates a bunch of my questions because if you break it down to if you can get good at finding a good deal, it actually <laughs> solves so many of these uh, so many of the problems that people it are does. finding. But therein lays. It, I think it's even better than location, right? People say location, 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 but you can have the best location in like let's say L.A. or New York. Yeah. But if you didn't make any money on the buy, that's going to be a very expensive condo or whatever you bought into, right? Yeah. But uh, don't get me wrong, it, location is still important. I'm still going to be a snob when it comes to the areas I like to buy in. Because you always got to think, I'm going to have to sell this someday. Or maybe my kids won't want this building. Mm. So what's the exit plan going to be like? You know, you know, you don't want to buy in a terrible part of town. You want to buy in a good, you might not be able to afford the best part of town. And frankly, that's probably where you're going to buy your principal residence. You know, mm. try to get into the best rental markets you can. Because then if there is or ever is a zombie apocalypse, you know, where are people going to want to rent? You know, close to the downtown, close to where the action is. They want a nicer unit. They want a better maintained home. They don't want to have crackhead neighbors, you know, all mm. that stuff. 
that's about as blunt as it can be really put. When people talk about uh, location, 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 right? Sometimes um, I would ask the people, uh, would you buy this property that is uh, to flip, let's say, if it was in the hood. And let's just say the hood still has people who are buying and want to and need to live there yeah. because I mean, I'm using the word hood a little lightly, but let's just say, you know. Let's call it like entry level homes. Entry like what's the cheapest? I like that. I like yeah, that. Well, yeah. you know, there's well, a like bare that. minimum uh, of what, you know, homes just cost what they home. What, yeah. uh, homes just cost what they cost. There's right? going to be more affordable homes. But really, actually, when I'm saying the hood, the reason why I want to uh, still touch that a little is because. Uh, if you're buying a home uh, in a in an area that maybe is not right for you to live in, uh, it's one thing if you say I want to renovate it, sell it to somebody who is willing to live in this neighborhood, and there are yeah. people who are, and that's fine, and everybody and everybody makes uh, their decisions, right? But you also have to consider that if you are forced to keep this property and you're managing it, are you comfortable managing this demographic of people? Yeah, because you got to have a plan B and a plan C and a exactly plan right. Yeah. There was a period of time where a lot of people were doing that with Hamilton. They were buying properties in Hamilton because on paper it looked great. And if you look at the cap rates, they told a certain story. And we'll talk about cap rates in a bit. But uh, they didn't realize the management cost of things like this. And so many people just realized that they're not cut out for this. Like Hamilton, especially at the time, was a totally different animal, right? You, you, go, to, you go and you lease in Toronto, everybody's qualified. The applications are strong. Like yes. there, It seems like there's a lot of people there when they're applying for rents. It's so competitive that they've grouped up and there's just strong applications. But you start going into uh, into neighboring cities a little further away, it, you have to start combing, yeah. right? And when you start combing and then you start looking through this, you just have to start knowing how to, um, how, to, how to vet properly. And you wanna be careful because you wanna be able to rent to people that you, if you're self-managing, that you can manage, right? It has to be people that you're comfortable with. So people That's need right. to consider this when they're looking at these properties. And assessing it, but London's a lot well, like Hamilton in that in that regard. Yeah, there's definitely parts of London and and a lot of cities where you it's like you know there's there's acronyms in London like you don't want to go EOA, which is East of Adelaide Street. Okay, right. So you got to make sure, and it's getting better. But so it's now it's like you don't want to be EOA, but if you're north of Huron, you're okay. Um, but yeah, I think maybe what you're trying to get at is like sort of like the Walmart effect, like you know the lowest. The lowest price is not the best, like by any means, right? Yeah. So, what was it Zeller's you know, the lowest price of the law? <laughs> I know, right? And, um, you know, if, if you can afford only an entry level flip, maybe you should just find a way to just go like that next, you know, because there's tiers, right? So, I would say like the best range to flip houses is, is going to be entry level up to average or medium. Mm -hmm. So, that's the sweet spot because then if anything above that, you're getting into higher end flips. And now you're, you know, those people are more demanding of what they want and they, yeah. they'll, if they have a budget of, 800 to a million dollars like they want what they want and they'll just go and wait till they get it so yeah the working class is definitely uh something i feel that people should always be cognizant of in terms of a buying population right largely um i don't know if you agree with this but i i for flips and anything you have to hold i prefer to keep things under a million largely because it opens the door to people who are putting less than 20 percent down on properties yeah. um and i think that's a It'd good affordable yeah it's a good consideration right because the minute you get over that now you've you've reduced your population, uh, your buying population to those who have those down payments. And times are tough. You have to be realistic about what, uh, what, what everyone's going through, right? And it's okay if you have a niche product that you know will sell, but then you also have to have your expectations set correctly. And these are things that, that is difficult to, there's so many nuances to have people consider when you're looking at different markets and you're talking to different people with different strengths, different resources. I like the point that you made about uh, when somebody's looking at financing, uh, people tend to go for the family members. People deal with realtors all the time, right? Uh, my friend's a realtor, and then they hope to get a kickback on the commission. Yeah. And then people find that they really get what they pay for, mm -hmm. and it becomes challenging, right? So no, you gotta. Life's too short not to work with A players, as my uh, as my models for sure. Yeah, I like the mortgage broker that your cousin who now knows all your financials, all your financials. Your mortgage <laughs> broker knows everything, and now it's that cousin that you don't even talk to, but he gave you He's a good tell all the other know. family members. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's gonna be a can we touch on self-storage? Sure. Tell me about your self-storage experience. Sure, <laughs> sure. That. So, uh, I mean, this has been something I've been interested in a long time. You know, it's funny. All these TV shows get a lot of exposure. I first actually learned how to do proper renovations. Uh, I mean, I guess my dad is like, he's m meticulous about things. Uh, so doing it right was always very important for my dad. But then it was like, you know, who else are you going to learn from? No YouTube. Well, there's Mike Holmes, right? So, but it's interesting, like even Storage Wars got a ton of, I don't know if it's, I'm sure it's still on TV in some capacity, but. Yeah. Um, it was interesting to the point where I'm like, it makes sense. Like people are very materialistic and I don't think that's going away. People need a place to store their stuff. And as affordability gets more and more challenging, people are going to need an extra garage somewhere. 
And, you know, there's literally like formulas in math that you run that if there's, you know, for the amount of people living in a city and you figure out how many square feet of storage there is, like you just see if it's oversaturated or undersaturated, right? So, um, so I've been looking for a place to buy for probably the last five, six years, mm -hmm. and um, they don't come up very often, nor did I really put all the time and effort into it. Like going, I could have went out there and just cold called a whole bunch of places and met the owners and all that stuff because it's the mom and pop shops that you want. I just put enough um, bugs in people's ears, letting them know this is something I'd like to buy in the future. And um, yeah, like another fellow investor, she couldn't, uh, she couldn't afford it. Um, and she's like, hey, Corey, this is something I know you want to buy um, self storage, but this one's just over my, my price, uh, my price bracket. So uh, if, you know, I'll do an intro and I'm like, hey, love to. And if, if it works out, I'm happy to pay you like a commission on it, finder's fee, whatever. And uh, worked out well. So this was like an old school realtor. He was just out there. He, did, he doesn't have a website. He doesn't have social media. He's just making phone calls. He's working the phone. He's calling these moms and pops and just, you know, seeing who would want to sell. Mm -hmm. So this was going back a year and a half ago. And the reason I got um, tipped off on it is because um, this realtor thought he was going to lose the deal because the guy who was originally going to buy it started to flake out in the last couple of weeks, right? So mm -hmm. now he's sending out the message to all of his investor clients saying, hey, who's interested in self-storage because I got someone who can't close on this. So mm -hmm. he tied it up for six months. So this, it was probably right in the heart of COVID. And then uh, by the time I closed on it, I mean, it was April of last year. So, you know, world's open again and things are good. And I think he actually at that point didn't want to sell it. He was actually trying to kill the deal, mm -hmm. trying to find any way out of it. I think I needed like three day extension to, cause I want to make sure the uh, environmental assessment came back. And the only way he'd do it is if I put an extra $50,000 down in deposit, not in front of him. I'm like, that's fine. Oh, I'm, okay. At least I, I was going to close yeah, on it anyways. I'm like, this is just the icing on the top. As long as it's got clean environmentals at the back. Cause there's like an extra half acre we can develop. Yeah or more maybe it's an acre or something like that mm. but yeah so it, it's it's a you know it's a totally different than landlord tenant act for people that are in ontario um i did my first couple auctions recently and i mean i don't like to auction people's stuff off we literally gave these people eight months to make it up we were, but then they they have pay-as-you-go phones and they're not answering their email not taking phone calls we're sending them registered letters and at some point you're just like i'm owed 800 dollars for this unit that's only 125 bucks a month like we got to get it you know performing again mm. right so um there's a website out there um it's called bid 13 triple uh, w bid 13.com great easy website you just go in film a video upload it and you set a date for your auction they say usually at least five to seven days maybe ten yeah and people bid on it and they just want to have that rush and that thrill of you know buying stuff and what's in the unit and one guy the body he's an auctioneer so he knows he was literally showing me all this stuff he's like if this has this the other half of it it's worth three hundred dollars, and that pays for half the unit that I just paid you. That's so, so interesting. Like he just knew, and these are like garage sale geeks and <clears throat> people that do this stuff all the time. They're selling stuff on every single platform, hmm. and yeah, that's just what they do. Make a little bit of money again. It's a, it's a side hustle, right? So if they buy a storage unit for five hundred or a thousand bucks, and they can make three thousand, you know, you do some of those a year. That's a couple of vacations for them. Do you find that a boring business? Store. I I kind of like when my investments are boring. You yeah, know, I'll keep my excitement for things outside of you know. Because that sounds are exciting. Boring, what you just said. <laughs> that's interesting, but it's not happening every day. Yeah. Um. True. I had somebody who was uh, we caught them living in a storage unit a couple mm. weeks ago. So what'd you do about it? It's good to have good eyes and ears at your property. So my the person that does the grass and the snow there, he does this at scale, and he's um he needed a place to park his lawnmowers and all that stuff. So I said, sure, like you park your uh, longer flatbed trailers off to the side here. And uh, he gives me a good deal on cutting the grass and all that stuff. So he was like, sends an email saying, uh, hey guys, uh, there's something weird going on here. We see someone parking their car in front of the unit and the unit's left open, you know, a foot for, I guess, airflow. And he's like, I took a peek in there and he's literally got a bed and everything set up in there. So I was like, wow. If he does that again tonight, let us know. We'll call the OPP. They'll go find out what's going on, which we did. And he was super embarrassed. But the OPP and the, and the police will uh, ask him to leave. Yep. Yeah, you can't be can't be living in a storage. Yeah, way unit. better than the LTB. <laughs> yes, way better than yeah. LTB. And recently, in in my hometown, there was a huge uh, loss at a storage facility. They lost um, ten percent of their units from a fire. So mm. I'm like, I don't know if this person, when the weather gets colder, they're going to start a ker kerosene uh. heater in there or whatever. So it's not good. No, and, actually, uh, and you know what? Sometimes uh, people have moral qualms with some of this stuff, but the truth is that uh, there is there is it, these places are not set up to accommodate people, no. right? And uh, you can and go on YouTube. You can find videos of people that live in these units and they get Wi-Fi. Yeah. Usually yeah. those are like inside heated units, like yeah. climate control, but it's like, 
I like this. the idea that we're such a fan of Storage Wars, the TV show, that we just go out and buy a whole storage facility. <laughs> <laughs> like, I love the show is so much. <laughs> well, it, it kind of exposes you to like, okay, if this is the worst that could happen, someone just leaves a whole bunch of random stuff in there. And I, I know lots of junk collector, like junk removal guys and all that stuff. So, um, but it's just a really easy, reputable business. And when I heard, when I was talking to the owner of the facility, he's like, Corey, people just like keep their stuff there for so long it's ridiculous one time somebody rented from me for six years and they eventually ended up i couldn't get a hold of them anymore maybe they passed away i'm not sure because he wasn't collecting like next of kin information which is what we do mm -hmm. on our applications and leases and stuff now but um he's like we opened the door and all that was in there was a love seat so when you do the math on that well, yeah there was only the there was seat. only a love seat in there so when we did the math on it they literally paid like eight or nine thousand dollars to store this love seat over the years maybe there's more stuff in there but it's like that's a pretty expensive love seat yeah and it's being stored outside so it's like like it smells like mold after a while because it's like freeze thaw freeze thaw thaw damp cold like damp hot whatever and it's like you can't store stuff outside for long unless it's like yeah. machinery or equipment or whatever. by the way personally i hate storage not as an industry I hate storage as in having storage. And it's because I come from a family where uh, there's a lot of emotion when it comes to stuff. And I get it. I get it. I get sentimentality, you know, uh, and I understand wanting to wanting to keep things. But some people uh, need to find a purpose for things. And, it, and not everybody is coming from the same mentality. Some people just don't like to see these things go to a landfill. They don't want to waste these things. They don't mm -hmm. want to have to go buy something that they can repurpose something else. It's just there's something in people. Yeah. And... Uh, and I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. The only problem is that storage makes things out of sight and out of mind. And uh, I see a lot of real estate investors put things into their rental units. Like how many real estate investors store all of their extra stuff in the rental property garage, yeah. right? Build, right? <laughs> and then, uh, or- Because they the, think they're going to need it sometime, right? Exactly, I'm right? guilty as well. I still got, I'm like, oh, we got you know two more boxes of flooring. I'll just keep it. I won't return it because what if there is? And sometimes you just got to keep it in case there is damage. And you got to patch something up. If you have that flooring there, yes, yeah. right? Uh, and if you know that it's there, because the problem is that a lot of people forget that it's there and then just go buy more flooring. Yeah. And they only find it when they go to store that extra flooring in the exact same spot the old one is. Yeah, that's why you got to standardize. Standardize all the stuff you use in your rentals as much as possible. We use one color paint. Uh, sorry, one color paint for the trim and ceilings and one color paint for the walls. I used to do four different colors and give people a choice. I'm like, no. No more of that. We're going to use a color called, uh, is it Swirling Smoke or Shark? No, it's Shark. Shark from Dulux. Great color. Not as dark as like Revere Pewter that some people like from Bedroom or all that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So um, go check it out. Google it if you want to see the color. It's called uh, Shark from Dulux. But uh, it was just good. It's like a chameleon color. It goes with everything. Yeah. So it just makes it simple. Touch-ups just it doesn't I can, matter. I can tell the level of landlord we're at when we have colors. Because I have a color too. <laughs> Lazy Gray Sherwin-Williams. Yeah. Shout out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the only Pro color I use. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have colors. You need it, man. You need it. Because it's like, you know, you got you got so much stuff that you're storing in your brain. If you can just make it simple and boil it down to like as few choices as possible. The yeah. trim has got to be a trim that you can just get from Home Depot. Because yeah. in case you need it. You can just go to the big box store whenever you need it to go get it. Um, you know, locks, we just use, uh, we use Schlage like locks, like, you know, just keep it simple. Mowing taps. My, my family's from a construction background. Um, so there are certain things I was taught. Like, do you always use mowing, for example? And we do that for the shower faucets because, you know, those are easy to repair. But every now and then. Yeah, and they're free parts and lifetime warranty. Exactly, right? right? And it's easy if you have a property manager to, uh, to, to keep a few of those in stock and then give them to whoever's going to go do the cartridge replacement, right? Because you have to hire somebody. It can be quite expensive. But what I found uh, over a period of time was that sometimes certain things, uh, and this is where my family just buys things more than what we need. I remember one time we bought from Ikea uh, like 140 faucets, right? Because they oh. were on super clearance, like super clearance. We got them for, I think like- Nine bucks or something? Yeah, tw uh, in the teens. But yeah, it was under wow. 20 bucks a, a faucet, right? And it was just on massive clearance. So we bought them all because at that price, we can afford to replace the whole faucet every time it breaks, yes. right? And you don't have to True. worry. And they were good faucets and they we haven't had to replace any of them when we, after we installed them. Um, but yeah, standardization, uh becomes a thing and you know the, one of the hallmarks of a landlord or a real estate investor especially one who's handling it themselves is you know the the key jingles you know they have the ring of keys and none of them are labeled and yep. they they go to a place and they're testing a million keys they go to the yeah, realtor go to, and be like here are the, the keys go to the master key yeah. <laughs> exactly yeah so master keys i find are are actually excellent to have um do you master key your properties we do um, per property or one for all 
per usually do it by city so you know i got one locksmith in one city he masters those and sometimes depending on like if you're wiser versus schlag like i've actually got two master keys because i didn't want to absolutely replace everything so he's like look save a little bit of money if you have two master keys so then we can still work with the cylinders and all that stuff right so but yeah. having a master key setup is important yeah mask exactly right honestly uh it it saves a lot of headache and not only that if you need to send somebody if they are working with uh with a locksmith a shop you can send your property manager and they can make that key from nothing yep. right they'll, they'll keep it on locks themselves out we're just like call call that locks and they'll pick it up yeah exactly so the, the, these are the benefits to doing it sometimes people just go to home depot i wish that's one thing i wish i had started from the start is uh making all the keys consistent yeah uh, it would be way easier because we've changed so many locks over the years, right? Well, people don't have that vision of like, what am I, what's this going to grow to in five years or 10 years? Yeah. I, I didn't have that vision. Nobody told me that. I wish that would have been one of the things that my mentors would have told me. But um, build the system as if you were going to scale it. Even if you don't end up scaling it, you still did it properly out of the gates. And But you don't have to go overboard. Like some people think they need a, like a three-tier corp or something like that with their first property. Maybe you do, but most of the time you don't. So make sure that you're actually going to when I do this more often, I think I got into that stuff after I bought my fifth property or something like that. Mm -hmm. So some of them are in my personal name, but a bunch of them are in corpse now. Yeah, yeah. yeah you want to make sure that whatever system you have, you can't break it. Because like, if you're just getting a system that's going to be okay now, but you're going to break it in six months, like then you got to redo it. And then you're going to break it again, redo it, break it again, add more staff, whatever. So just get the right software, get the right key set up, get the right supplies that you're using. And this is why I think it's important that uh, people need to get in the room and talk to people who are experienced. This is why mm -hmm. I think if anybody's talking to you and you get a feel of where somebody is and where they're going, what type of person they are, these are things that can be advised that will make sure that, you're, that you don't have to go and undo things later as you progress through your endeavors. Yeah. Right? So I think that's important. important. Quick question about the storage, though. I want to know, um, is 7 to 8% cap rate considered good in the space uh, and is easy to develop in Canada? And are you like looking to develop more of that in Canada? Yes, 7 to 8 is, is good in the space because it was it's hard to find that. Um, we bought ours at a 6, which is very good because most storage is selling between 3 and 5, I'd say. 3 right? and 5. Yeah, because they, they know it's a it's a great asset class, right? It's it's recession resilient. Um, you know, even though you might not like it, like people are not going to, I don't know, We'll let the listeners here vote on this, but do you think people are going to get less materialistic or more materialistic? I think people are still going to be materialistic and just buy stuff to throw it away and hold on to it and all that stuff, right? So and houses get smaller, right? Everybody's you know condos are getting smaller. Every you know living conditions are getting smaller. It's a thing. So, yeah, for it makes sure. sense to have more storage. Even just stuff mm -hmm. that you don't want clogging up your house, right? Like uh, if you got two or three cars at home, just the winter tires, like storing that, can take up a half your parking spot for the, your car to go in the winter time so the place to just go put your stuff right yeah it's a second home and um or it's like you know people that um they're dealing with their parents estates or they're dealing with like i'm selling my house so i've got to thin the house out and store the stuff for you know houses are taking longer to sell now mm. you know so they'll be storing their stuff for three to six months until it closes now with longer closing times right so we get lots of different situations outdoor storage is cool too because people just want to park an rv park a boat or park a classic car or whatever and it's 60, 70 bucks a month. And it's like, yep, no yeah. problem. These are all great reasons why people want to store their stuff. But like when you buy a storage unit, to me, it's very attractive because like there's no LTB. That's right. Right. I don't have to wait. Like you said, you waited eight months. Yeah. Which, you know, after you talking to, to other, right? after I talked to other storage owners, they're like, nope, they're late one month. We overlocked the unit. So there's actually a space for two locks on the doors. They overlock it or they lock them out on the gate code. So we're getting an automatic right. gate put in. Um, so they lock that code out so they just can't get in to get their stuff they could try they could hop the fence with barbed wire and but now they're going to call you yeah and then, i'm sorry and yeah, can i, I find a way to pay um so we like that you can also do rent raises with very little notice too like you know two weeks notice i think is all you require we'll give them 30 days of like hey rent raise going up um so we bought ours at a six cap and then just by doing a rent raise and making sure all the units were full um and fixing a few things like we kind of turned into like an eight cap if you did the numbers on purchase price yeah, yeah. sounds like a great buy sounds like we should sell our all our places <laughs> and buy storage well, we may, units will i go into it more like will i maybe develop something in the future yeah they're cheap to they're cheap to develop too yeah. uh, in canada i mean you just got to make sure that you got your your permits and your bylaws and site plan and all that stuff put together the most interesting thing is you got to make sure that the fire truck can get around the storage facility and you know do their loops and turns mm. and whatever when you're building it something i'd make sense now but i was like oh interesting i didn't really consider that 
Mm. You got to make sure that uh, sometimes you're too close to the fence that the back wall is fireproofed. I see. So there's going to be some fire code requirements on some things. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I know that it's really people... just cement and aluminum and yeah. steel. And I'm thinking about it because it, I do think it's interesting because I know that people who are going to be listening to this and then especially in Canada who have uh, maybe less standardized multi-unit properties, there are people who are getting tired of it right and uh should they cash out uh they'd be interesting they'd be interested in something that's considerably more boring because like i said a mm-hmm. lot of people i feel like they did the real estate they started wrong and it's a little too exciting it's not supposed to be and they just want to go on the drastic ex- extreme to get something where yeah. it, it's, oh, it's easy it to be, burn out yeah. yeah so usually what i find people they don't do is they don't bring on any help they don't bring on any so i i started getting a part-time assistant with my properties when i had 20 doors and that was only about Four properties mm. right so get get some help before you think you need it um and i tell this for people in all parts of their life right get a cl- get some cleaning help at home don't cut your own grass at home i mean there's going to be a point where you get started and you just don't have very much money so you got to do a lot of the stuff yourself but you know you should be trying to evolve and make a higher income at your day job or have a side hustle so that you can actually pay for some extra help because mm. when you buy back your time that's when you can go on the vacations and all the other yeah. stuff and you're waking up and sleeping and you're still making money every single day with your properties, right? So um, people get burnt out because they don't have good staff to help. You know, I'd rather manage two or three people for all my properties versus me running around doing all this stuff. Like there's no sense in getting another job or being busy. There's no badge of honor for being busy, right? At the end of the day, your life is going to be judged and the people that come to your funeral are going to be like the lives that you changed, the lessons you taught other people, not how hard you worked or you worked an extra hour. It's important to go the extra mile for people for sure, but um, you got to make sure you're impacting people in your life. And that's what it's really about, right? Like, why are you guys doing real estate? Is this sort of like a means to an end? You guys are looking for freedom as well. Um, my mom like told me how to do it, so you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's a powerful enough reason. I don't know this guy. I don't know why you did. It. Why'd you do it? Uh, my parents, uh, same story as you. Like, my dad was a hard worker. My mom was a stay at home mom. Um, nobody invested in real estate in my family, and it was like when I met these guys, these guys were doing it, and I knew that if I put my put my mind to it i you know maybe not work a nine to five for the rest of my life like my parents yes um so you know i jumped i jumped in and gives you freedom you, and you, options you just said the hire a cleaner thing you know i, I hired a cleaner six eight months ago and oh, it was, it's been the best you know when you, you hired a cleaner dude it's the best like why why are we working so hard if we're not like making our life easier at home yes where i can spend more time with missy instead of missy like cleaning the house for two hours Right, we let the cleaner do it for like okay. 30, 40 bucks an hour. Okay, I'm gonna it's, get stuck on that for a second because, like, how did you? And I want to know too, how did you convince your your partners? It was Missy's idea. Oh, perfect. How about you? That was easy. Um, a little bit harder for us because my wife comes from a European background, and if you hire that sort of stuff out, it's like um, it's kind of like yeah, Shame. it's one badge. Of, yeah, it's like a badge <laughs> of honor they don't like. But um, so now that we're very close to my mother-in-law, um, she helps out with a lot of that stuff. But mm-hmm. when we were living 20 minutes, 30 minutes, or 45 minutes away from them, yeah, we had cleaners. And I was just like, I don't know. Like, our time is more valuable spent with the kids when they're young. We never get that time back. Yeah. Versus like, and we found some really good cleaners for like 30 bucks an hour. Yeah, it's not expensive. Right? Like and they love what they do. Like, that's just how they're wired. They are like, I am a clean freak. Let me do this for you, right? So they just, they do. When they can actually do a better job than you do, I'm very detail-oriented. Like, I am like, they call me eagle eyes because I notice everything. Like when they do as great of a job, I can't really find anything. I'm like, hey, just do your thing, right? And mm-hmm. they use the chemicals that we want. Like we want like stuff that's not really toxic and all that stuff, right? So um, it's the same with cutting your grass. I remember uh, the first property I bought, I cut the grass. Then I bought one, literally one, three doors down. I was like, okay, I can still cut. After a while, I was like, man, I just wasted a half a day on Saturday cutting the grass. I'm not doing this anymore. If I heard about a guy who would cut grass for 20 bucks an hour, done. You go cut the grass. Yeah. Right? He'd miss, you know, some of the corners or whatever. I'm like, it's a rental. It's yeah. not a big deal. Actually, you know what? Uh, on the cutting the grass and the shoveling the snow thing. So um, okay, so I have a, a slip disc, a herniated disc, a mm. L5-S1. And uh, it's it's okay now. Like I exercise. I, I'm careful if I'm aware of it. But I herniated my disc after buying my first rental property and the snow dropped heavy. And I was like, I'm oh my God, I, I don't want to Yeah. So I went over there, shoveled the snow and, and the stupid snow truck shoveled my car in so mm-hmm. i had to take that out as well and i didn't realize that i i slipped my disc and and then i was working construction at the time i was gonna walk it off well, not a great idea and uh and then i went to a real estate seminar where the guy was talking about 
valuing your time and not uh and yep. you know is your time worth more than uh 25 bucks an hour can you hire a kid who here shoveled their own snow and i'm there with the disc or the slip disc and i'm like okay yeah this yeah what's the saying if, if you don't have help or hired help you are the hired help right but, you, you know people don't know what they don't know and sometimes people can either be a, a you know witness to others right so they can listen to this and hear your story or they can be an example and they can live through your story, right? So what would people rather be? Would they rather witness something and learn the lesson? Or they, they sometimes people need to experience some things, right? So sorry about your back. How long ago was that? Okay, it wasn't my first property. It was like, uh, but yeah, I think I was, I was early 20s. Mm. Right? And I used, to, I used to go to the gym all the time. And uh, it's emotionally taxing because uh, like I used to run and stuff. And you can, I can't run. Even today, I can't do anything that has a significant vertical impact, mm. right? Uh I can, for example, I can exercise running doing stairs because the, the, the yeah, impact is cushioned. Yeah. yeah. But I can't uh, go long lengths and run straight because the, the vertical impact is too great. Wow. So yeah, that, that's challenging. And, um, and uh, yeah, and these are, these are the stupid little things that like, okay, you know. Well, I had a student of mine, he uh, went to go do, he was just about finished a renovation. He was trying to push for that appraisal, right? Yeah. And uh, it needed like, an hour of extra like punch punch pull items so he goes there he's trying to do the stuff himself and he literally like almost cuts the tip of his thumb off he had to go to the hospital so it's like the, his saying now is just because you can do it doesn't mean you should do it by the way your your cultural back are you you're italian or i'm a mix of it I, i'm uh, my grandma's italian my grandfather is scottish and then my mom's german so i'm like a little bit of everything but, okay okay you know so we got that work ethic you know quality ethic uh, i don't know frugality a little bit and stuff too i mean my dad used to always try to do stuff himself i remember being up on a roof he would hire the roofer to do the hard stuff and then he'd do the easy stuff because we had a pretty walkable roof right but, yeah yeah um try to do the painting try to do this try to do that that was sort of more the mentality back in the day but now as you're evolving and, and we need more business owners in the world you got to think like a business owner and yeah. uh, you got to make sure that you can outsource it. Because the best use of people's time listening to this podcast is go out and find better deals, go work on your negotiation skills, learn how to buy stuff, make money on the buy, go learn how to raise money, like work on those skills that we need to be like investors, go learn how to hire, how to train, how to be a better leader. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Hire people and circulate the economy a little bit because there's not enough people doing it. No, for sure. And but that becomes challenging for those who come from um, these backgrounds where you have a, a father or a grandfather or somebody in your family who's yeah, like the naysayers. A, yeah, but they also come from something like I always try to appreciate what they had and how it got us to where we are, which is honestly a reasonably mm -hmm. comfortable position, right? Because it was that saving mentality, it was that do things yourself and conserve yeah. mentality that provides us honestly the fortune and opportunity in many cases to be able to do certain things, yeah. right? So. I try to appreciate it, but I also I think people need to also understand how it is. It is also something that can hold you back if you know your journey is taking you a certain way. You know, people need to uh, realize this isn't our parents' economy either, right? So I come from that. You know, I've I've seen that before as well. Especially my wife, her father literally did well. He retired when he was forty six, just because interest rates are like you know ten to twenty percent. He just had some money in the bank and just kept growing and growing and growing. Like he. He was able to do that just by saving and getting interest. And I'm sure he'd made some smart investments and stuff, but most of it was just like the interest. I remember being a kid, having a paper route, having a couple hundred bucks in the bank. I'm like, what's this 20 bucks that pops in the account once in a while? And they're like, that's interest. It's like, I don't see those kinds of interest numbers anymore now. Um, so it's a different, you know, if you look back at what people used to make in the 60s, 70s, 80s, compare it to now, and then you compare the price of the assets, like it just doesn't line up anymore. I remember being young, my dad was making 45,000 a year. Things have gone up way more in value. That same job maybe pays eighty now. So, yeah. but houses are six, seven mm -hmm. times more expensive. So it's just you. You got to be smarter, and you got to use leverage to your advantage. And you got to be smart. The times they change. As long yeah, as they you went through the biggest boom generation we've ever seen. So exactly right. So yeah, for sure. And this is where I think if if anybody's ever struggling, because um, a lot of people who get into real estate, I find that their family members are can often be trying to protect you too much yep. to the point where it's they say, but yeah, right, but. It's okay for you to do what you know you need to do. Um, I see some people trying to convince their parents uh, to change their mentality. Yeah. It's like, you know, this saying, you can't teach an old dog a new trick, right? I mean, it's not true always, but um, just understand that there is a lot of resistance there. Well, you can choose right? your friends. You can choose your environment. You can't choose your family though, right? Your family's, your family's purpose in life is to love, support, and encourage you. And sometimes, you know, you don't get all those, check all those boxes from your family. Um, 
But yeah, at the end of the day, make sure that you, you can mitigate a lot of risk with the right education and the right wisdom. Um, so by listening to podcasts, watching YouTube videos, reading books, getting in the right rooms, like mm -hmm. people can mitigate a lot of that risk. And that gives you the confidence to actually move forward and do what you're supposed to do as a real estate investor, right? Yeah. And it's all levels. Like when people try to skip too many levels and they're like, okay, I heard on this podcast, Corey's doing storage and burrs. And, you know, I used to do a lot of like furnished rentals. We got 15 of those and fairly big portfolio, but you got to make sure that you understand the background of like, I, I had some good things going for me at the time. I was making good income. I had a background in HR, so that made the property management easier. I had all the, you know, easy for me to make, make systems. And then me for teaching people right now, I had, you know, 20 years of teaching experience before I even started. So um, I always get, try to understand someone's reference points in their background before you just try to jump in and do exactly what that other, other person does. Because if you're chasing someone else's vision and their values and stuff, you're just going to end up chasing some shiny object. You know, make sure you got your own North Star, what's important for you. Where do you host these events? Yeah, so we got a monthly meetup. It's called the Strategic Success Networking Event. And uh, it's the, right now it's at the Oakville Conference Center. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to be up there until, you know, at least the new year. And we might pick a different venue in January. We'll see how this one continues to perform for us. So um, we just think it's important to bring people back together. It's almost like a weak muscle. People just are, you know, the world's open again, but they're just not used to going out and getting around other people. Or it's like, oh man, money's tight. Like, you know, I could use this money to buy lunch or whatever. Um, but no, it's like, we definitely want to make sure that people are getting value when they go there. Right. So, mm -hmm. and the cool part was just all the DMs we're getting afterwards. It's like, wow, now I'm doing business with this person or this person's in the same business as me, or I met someone else from my city. Um, they help open up their Rolodex for me. Or, you know, if you're in a good quality room, there's always going to be great outcomes that come from yeah. it, right? So yeah, if you just go to like some random bar to have drinks, maybe not as much will come from that. But when you're in an intentional room where we've handpicked all the people that do our updates, all the people that are on the panel, we pick the, uh, the keynote speaker. We have like a coach's corner where we're also trying to give like our best stuff that we've learned over the past month to the audience too, so... Yeah, yeah, that, uh, that sounds like cool, a man. that sounds like a great time. Right? If you're if you're if you are somebody who is interested in real estate and you want to get out at all, I don't see why you would go to anything else other than something like that. Because you know that's a sure as hell way to meet people with uh, who can both relate to you and also probably help you in the di in the direction you want to go. Yes, so that sounds pretty amazing. Uh, if people want to find out about these things, how do they go about finding out? Yeah, so I've got, probably the easiest way to find it is just if people are on Instagram, go to my my bio, right? So there's a link tree link there and there's always like popular things there like go, you know, find out about this uh, next event that we have coming up or watch some things on my YouTube channel or if they ever need some help, fill out a coaching intake form or whatever it might be, right? So pretty easy to find. Everything is Corey McKinnon, CoreyMcKinnon.com. Uh, Corey McKinnon on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. It's all there. Perfect. Okay. Well, just to make it easy, we're going to have some information about that in the description below. But awesome. Corey, great to have you on the show. Oh, it's been fun, guys. You guys have a great setup here and uh, heard great things and uh, glad that we we're able to make this happen.